It is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Pastor Nathan Lino, Senior Pastor of First Baptist Church Forney in Forney, Texas. A fourth-generation African, Nathan Lino founded Northeast Houston Baptist Church in 2002 and served as their senior pastor until June 1, 2022. When he began his tenure as the senior pastor at First Baptist Church Forney, for those of you that do not know, Forney is just east of here, which means we're neighbors. That's really what it means. His ministry opportunities have taken him to more than 25 countries around the world. Nathan has served as president of the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, the first vice president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and on the board of the International Mission Board. Nathan became a Christian while attending Pine Town Baptist Church in South Africa and was baptized and ordained at Forest Baptist Church in Kingwood, Texas. He graduated from Texas A&M University and completed his MDiv at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Nathan and Nicole have been married since 1999. They have four children, Colton, Campbell, Cassidy, and Chloe. I think you guys read some books, didn't you? There you go. Hey, would you please join me in welcoming Pastor Nathan Lino today? Hi, y'all. Uh, it's so good to be with you today. I've been looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to be standing here. This is my first time ever on your campus, uh, but over the years of my ministry, I have used the resources that this school has put out uh, a lot. Many of my friends have graduated from this school, and I have a deep appreciation for Dallas Theological and for everything our Lord Jesus has done in and through you. So thanks for having me today. Won't you open your Bible, please, to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 to 22. Revelation 3, 14 to 22, where today the Word of God is going to remind us that exclusive dependency on Jesus is at the root of personal intimacy with Jesus. Exclusive dependency on Jesus is at the root of personal intimacy with Jesus. Let me read for us this morning Revelation 3, verse 14 to 22. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and self to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We're just going to walk backwards through the passage because it's going to help us understand the heart of the passage more quickly. So I want you to look first of all at verse 21, because in verse 21, we find what all of us as disciples want. In verse 21, we discover that it's, impos that it's possible for us to climb on the throne with Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords in this universe. Jesus says, I'm inviting you to be enthroned with me on my throne as I sovereignly rule over the universe. And this invitation in verse 21 is not merely some future reality, it is also a current possibility. The Word of God tells us, for example, in Ephesians 2 verse 6, that one of the many great benefits we received at our salvation from Christ is that we were seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. 
Hey, may I remind you, brothers and sisters, that to be seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus, that's the place of true freedom. That is the place of the abundant life Jesus died for you and I to experience. It's the place of his transcendent peace. It's the place of his supernatural power at work in and through you. Sitting on the throne with Jesus in verse 21, that's the place of your thriving. Well, how do we climb on the throne in verse 21? Well, he tells us in verse 20. The way you climb on the throne with me in verse 21 is by opening the door and letting me come in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Well, what in the world could that mean? Most of us, when we hear this verse, immediately associate it with evangelism of non-Christians. And while it is true that if you have not yet put all your trust in Jesus Christ alone to save you and invited him into your heart as your king, that if you do that, he will save you. You and I have to remember that the primary audience of verse 20 is not non-Christians, it's Christians. It's born again, Holy Spirit sealed believers in Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Well, the passage starts with, to the church at Laodicea. So what in the world could Jesus mean in verse 20 when he says to believers, I'm on the outside of a church, not the inside, knocking on the door, trying to get in. And what's going on here in verse 20 is we encounter one of the many places in the Bible that we find the manifest presence of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 14, verse 20 and 21, that, hey, I got to go away to heaven, but don't fret because after I go, the Holy Spirit of God is going to come and he's going to fill you. And when he does, in those days, I will manifest myself to you. He says it twice. I will manifest myself to you and the world won't see me, but you will know me. And what's happening here in Revelation 3.20 is it's one of the many times in the Bible we encounter the manifest presence of God. Can I just remind you this morning that there is more to the presence of God than His omnipresence? I mean, if all there is to the presence of God is His omnipresence, why does it matter, for example, in the book of Genesis that Adam and Eve were evicted from the Garden of Eden? Because if all there is to His presence is His omnipresence, He was as present outside the garden as He was inside the garden. If all there is to His presence is His omnipresence, why did it matter that the Israelites had the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night with the presence of God inside of it? For He was in His omnipresence, is present with them as much outside the cloud as He was inside. If all there is to the presence of God is His omnipresence, why did Moses say to God, if you will not send your presence with us into Canaan, we will not go in either? If all there is to the presence of God is His omnipresence, why did it matter that the Israelites had the temple with the Holy of Holies and the presence of God inhabiting the Holy of Holies? For God would have been as present outside the temple as He would have been inside the temple. If all there is to the presence of God is His omnipresence, why did Jesus instruct His disciples in Luke 11 to keep on seeking, keep on asking, keep on knocking on the door of our Heavenly Father until they receive the good gift of the Holy Spirit? If all there is to the presence of God is His omnipresence, why does Paul write in Ephesians 5.18 to Holy Spirit-sealed believers to seek the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. And if all there is to the presence of God is His omnipresence, how is it here at the end of the Bible in Revelation we encounter Jesus saying, behold, I'm standing outside a church of Holy Spirit sealed believers trying to get in. What we encounter here, brothers and sisters, in, a, in Revelation 3.20 is the manifest presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. His near 
felt, undeniable, measurable presence. When God comes near, James chapter 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And this language Jesus is using in verse 20, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. He's talking here about the deepest possible intimacy you and I can have with our Lord Jesus Christ on this side of heaven. So whether you want to call it his manifest presence or you want to call it the filling of the Holy Spirit or you want to call it deep personal intimacy with Jesus Christ, that's what he's talking about here in Revelation 3 verse 20. And he's saying, when I fill you, when my manifest presence fills you, that's the place of freedom. That's the place of healing. That's the place of comfort. That's the place of my peace. That's the place of my supernatural power in you and through you at work in your life. That's the place of the abundant life I died for you to have. What we want is the presence of Jesus Christ. Well, that just raises the question, okay, well then, how how do I experience the presence of Jesus like that? Well, go to the verse above it in verse 19. The way you open the door and let Jesus in like that, you let his presence flood your life, is you zealously repent. That's his instruction in 3.19. Zealously repent and I will come in. Okay, well, Nathan, what am I zealously repenting of? Well, now go back to verse 15 and 16 and see what he says. There's a sin of which you and I need to repent that's costing us the presence of Jesus in the passage. Now listen to verse 15, 16. I I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth lukewarm. Now listen, we would use the term spiritual complacency. We would use the term a loss of desperation for Jesus. Now in a lot of Bible teaching today, what you will hear is we need to become desperate for Jesus again. And we do. And we do. But listen carefully to the text. The sin in the text is not spiritual complacency and a loss of desperation. Verse 15 and 16 is the symptom of the sin problem. Spiritual complacency and loss of desperation for Jesus isn't the sin, it's the symptom of the sin. The sin he's telling us to zealously repent of is in verse 17. The heart of the problem is this. They had lost their exclusive dependency on Jesus alone to satisfy them and to secure their lives. Here's the accusation Jesus makes against them in verse 17. You say you're rich and have prospered and need nothing, not realizing the reality that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. See, what has happened is Jesus had so blessed his people. He had so prospered them, in their case, with money. That they didn't intend to, they didn't mean to, they they weren't being malicious. They hadn't turned away from Jesus, at least consciously. These were not like wicked, rebellious people. But what had happened to them as sinners saved by grace is that subtly over time, they had started trusting in Jesus and his blessings to satisfy them and to secure their lives instead of trusting exclusively in Jesus alone. I want to be really clear about this. These were not people that had turned away from Jesus. How do we know that? They were at church. This was their sermon that day. To the church at Leia, they loved Jesus. They were gathering on the Lord's day and they were worshiping him and they wanted to hear from him. These were not people that had like turned away from Christianity. They loved Jesus. The problem is they now also loved money as much as 
or more than Jesus. They now loved what money could acquire for them as much as they loved Jesus. And they were now turning to money and what money could buy them to satisfy them and to secure them and provide them with that sense of security in life rather than trusting in our Lord Jesus alone. Just happened to be money for them. It could have been any other blessing Jesus had blessed them with that they had suddenly started trusting in to satisfy and secure them. They could have started believing that I require a spouse to feel satisfied and secure. I, re I require children. I require grandchildren. I require a certain nation's citizenship. I require a certain degree. I require a certain career. I require a certain kind of ministry in order to be satisfied and have a sense of security. The accusation of Jesus Christ, the sin that was costing them his presence, was that they had subtly and unknowingly started to trust in Jesus plus to satisfy and secure their lives. Now, I want you to watch this little spiritual formula Jesus has here in the text. Now, now notice this relationship between verse 15 and 16 and verse 17. The root problem, the sin that they were supposed to zealously repent from in verse uh, 19, the sin they're supposed to zealously repent of is the loss of exclusive dependency on Jesus alone. But the symptom by which they would know they had lost their exclusive dependency on Jesus alone is the loss of desperation for Jesus in verse 15 and 16. It's the symptom. I want you to think about this with me for just a moment. Think about a methamphetamine addict. When someone has an addiction, we say they have a dependency. When someone's an addict, their dependency has become so extraordinary that they require their drug of choice to satisfy them. They cannot be happy, they cannot feel free unless they have their drug of choice. And when they develop such an exclusive dependency on meth, suddenly they are willing to put at risk whatever they must put at risk to get more meth. They are that desperate for meth. Their dependency on meth has made them so desperate for meth that they're willing to put their marriage at risk to get more meth. Their whole family at risk. Their career and their income stream at risk. They're willing to risk all of their comforts and everything they know in their entire lives just to get this thing that they've become exclusively dependent upon. You and I know that dependency gives birth to desperation. And when you want to deliver an addict from their desperation for their drug, what you've got to deliver them from is their dependency on the drug. What Jesus is saying to us in verse 15 and 16 and verse 17 is the sin problem you and I need to watch out for when we live in conditions in which Jesus is blessing and prospering us is that subtly, as sinners saved by grace, we take his blessings, but they transition into idols. And idolatry is costing us the manifest presence of Jesus Christ. But it's hard to know if you have an idol. Do I have an idol? Don't I have an idol? So Jesus says, look, I've given you a really easy litmus test. Are you desperate for me? Your, your desperation for me bears evidence to the degree that you are depending on me alone to satisfy you and secure you. 
And so as you and I sit here together this morning at the end of the semester, we have to examine our hearts as it says in 1 Corinthians 11. What we want to know is, is there anything or anyone in my life that I have added to Jesus that I now require in order to be satisfied or to feel secure? But it's hard for me to know the answer to that question. Is there anything in my life I love as much as Jesus or more than Jesus? Is there anything in life I want as much as I want Jesus or that I want more than I want? It's hard for us to know the answers to those questions, but it's really easy to know the answer to this question. Are you right now currently desperate for Jesus? What are you willing to put at risk? For more of Jesus. Or as we would say in the Christian community, what am I willing to put on the altar? Is there any Abraham I want you to sacrifice Isaac test I would currently fail? My level of desperation tells me my level of dependency and why dependency matters is it's what triggers Jesus to show up in my life in his manifested presence and it's his manifest presence that's the place of the abundant life and true freedom there is no idol worth trading the presence of Jesus for And I just came by today to tell you that if you've lost your desperation for Christ, just to know about Him, but to know Him, to be head over heels in love with Him, to know the sound of His voice regularly in your life, You've lost your desire and your longing to spend time with Him. If you've lost your hunger and thirst for righteousness, there's an idol in your life. But if you'll repent of it, if you'll repent of idolatry, you'll get your tenderness and your desire your longing and your intimacy with Jesus back. Say, so, well, Nathan, how would, I, how would I repent of idolatry? How would I work my way back to intimacy with Jesus? Well, one recommendation I can give you is the first four Beatitudes. There's a reason Jesus gave us the Beatitudes. I love them. But just listen to the first four Beatitudes. They are a paradigm for finding renewed spiritual intimacy with Jesus Christ. Here's Beatitude number one. Humility, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you'll return to humility, you'll inherit the kingdom. You know how you inherit the kingdom? By inheriting the king out of whom flows the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom and the king of heaven. Humility. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. When you and I return to godly sorrow over our sin. Blessed are the meek. When you and I return to a place of absolute surrender of every aspect of who we are to King Jesus. Listen, apart from Jesus Christ, you and I are wild animals. Seeking to follow and satisfy every lustful desire of the heart. Like a wild animal just follows its desires. The only way for you and I to be brought under control, for you, to be brought to, for you and I to be brought to a position of righteousness, is for you and I to be broken like a horse tamer breaks a wild horse. And the tamer is Jesus. The only way you and I can be brought under control, the only way you and I can stop following the lustful desires of our hearts and the desires of our hearts can change and we can be conformed to the image of Jesus 
is by you and I embracing absolute surrender to Jesus as Lord of every room in our hearts. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you will be filled up with it. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for Jesus. You will be filled up with him. To return to a place where the controlling factor of my life, the driving factor of my life, like a wild animal that wakes up every day in the North African Middle Eastern desert, just driven to find food that day, driven to find an oasis of water that day, for without that food and water, it will surely die. The only way to get back to a place where we wake up every day and our number one controlling factor in our lives is where's Jesus? I need Jesus. I'm absolutely dependent on Jesus for everything. For him to become preeminent again. So look, you take these first four Beatitudes. This is what I would encourage you to do if you've lost your desperation for Jesus. Or to put it another way, if you've become an idolater. It's for you to come before Jesus Christ today before you go to bed tonight. And you get on your knees before Jesus Christ again. And you talk it out with him. You pray your way back to genuine humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You talk it out with him. You pray your way back to repentance of every known sin in your life. Blessed are those who mourn. You talk it out with him. You pray your way back to absolute surrender to Jesus. Letting him back into your heart as king over every room, every arena of your life. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you talk it out with him and you pray your way back to where Jesus is preeminent in your life. Number one, your greatest desire. And what you're going to find is exactly what's promised in that fourth beatitude. You will be satisfied. You will be filled up with the presence of Jesus. If you will just reconsecrate yourself to him and become him, his alone again. Last month, the Miami Hurricanes played Georgia Tech in football. 40 seconds left on the clock. Miami was winning and Miami had the ball. Georgia Tech didn't have any timeouts. They couldn't stop the clock. They'd lost the game. Miami was in a position where the victory had been won. It was already won. All Miami had to do was get in victory formation and experience the victory that had already been won. I don't know if you know what victory formation is. Victory formation is when there's seconds left on the clock and your team has the ball. All you've got to do is run out the clock to experience the victory that's already secured. And so your offensive line, the offensive linemen, they get low to the ground. They snap the ball to the quarterback, and all the quarterback does is get on his knee. And when the winning team, whose victory is already sure, gets low to the ground, they win the game. The victory is theirs. But for some reason, no one knows. Last month, with Miami in that position, they decided to get out of victory formation and do something different. And they ran a running play and handed the ball off to the running back who promptly fumbled the ball and turned it over. And three plays later, Georgia Tech threw a touchdown and won the game. And Miami lost to their enemy that day when victory had already been won. And it was all because they decided to get out of victory formation. It's all Jesus is saying in Revelation 3, 14 to 22. I already won it for you. I went to the cross and I died and I rose again, not just for you to escape hell, but for you to have me with my presence here and now on this side of heaven. Because my presence is the place of freedom. And I've done the work. And all I'm asking you to do is get in victory formation. And victory formation is to get low to the ground. 
to recognize you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. But I am everything you need. And if you will just humble yourself before me and trust in me exclusively to satisfy and secure you, I will do more than you can ever ask or imagine according to my power at work within you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your promise. We thank you for the victory that you have won for us. We thank you that your manifest presence is available to us. We thank you that you're here even in this room with us this morning. And Lord, what we see time and time again in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is that when we became sinners as the human race, we became idolaters. And it's what costs us your presence and your peace and your power. But thank you for your spirit and your word that convict us of sin. So that we can zealously repent. Opening the door for you to come in. And restoring intimacy between us and you. I pray that we would climb on your throne with you today. Before our heads hit the pillows tonight. We love you. We trust you completely. It's in your name we pray. Amen.